from surviving ethnic cleansing to dominating the business world. Bindi's journey will inspire you to chase your dreams against all odds. British left, they left a, a really sour taste in, in the population. They did the same thing in India as well. There was a massive a war between Tamils and Sinhalese. Growing up, I had to fight for my space. I had to fight for my identity. You know, did you have to, to fight for your colour too? It's, it's, a very, it's a very dangerous place to be. Sri Lankans and Indians who immigrated to Australia who didn't fight were always bullied. And I've always been a disruptor in my life. And I've done that. I've been able to monetize that working for, you know, Microsoft and Salesforce. And, and you would know this as being a salesperson, you're constantly on review. You're constantly having to prove yourself. Constantly on the edge. Yeah. You're only as good as your last deal. And we have a tall poppy syndrome. It's still, it's still common. It's still there. 100%. Um, and I truly believe that money corrupts you if you don't have the skills to I think we can upset a lot of people. This is reality. They need to understand that. I think we are a nanny nation. We are so, we are even scared of our own shadows. And we start, you know, we start to put laws into place that because of a, a you go to the UK now, racism is rampant. It's always been rampant. Now it's bubbled to the <laughs> surface. Australia is the same, you know, we're, we are a racist country. Now, whenever there is a conflict or a war, we always blame the Americans, you know, like it's all America, they're causing trouble and whatsoever. But the citizens of these countries, then unique soul. I'm different. I'm not like everyone else. And well, you're from the King of God's uh, <laughs> family. I love it. Um, that's going to be my new handle. Uh, you are a fighter. You are a warrior. You always come back from the dead woods and you just revive yourself um, in some shape, way or form. We're going to talk about your life overall, the ethnic cleansing that you've been through in Sri Lanka, the impact it had on your life, and how you progressed in the world of business, working with Microsoft, Salesforce, and many other uh, environments. So welcome to Brains Plot. Thank you very much. And... Uh... I'm really excited to be here and um, work with you and, and not just uh, tell my story, but, you know, I think it's a great opportunity to talk about uh, humans and how resilient we are. We can, you know, if we have uh, a goal in life and a real passion, we can really push forward, you know. So, 100%, yeah, thank 100%. You. Look, you're welcome. So let's start with your early life, um, the early stage in Sri Lanka. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a bit more on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I come from Sri Lanka, Colombo. Uh, I was born in Colombo uh, on the 7th of January, uh, 1977. Um, my, mom's, uh, my mom and dad, uh, Renuka and Mohan, uh, we come from a very educated Tamil family, um, which is a minority in Sri Lanka. Um, and, uh, you know, life was very good. You know, we, we lived a life of, uh, of money and, and affluence. And we lived in the middle of city in Colombo. Um, my grandfather was the head top engineer in Colombo. Um, so there's a lot of legacy that I guess my family had. Um, and overall, my family has been very, I guess, successful, and they've driven that through education and and pushing the envelope in terms of everything that we do. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it was it was a good life. I, I have some really fond memories of growing up in, in Colombo. Good. So before we go to like, Colombo and yeah. Sri Lanka, where is Sri Lanka? A lot of people don't actually know where Sri Lanka is. Sri Lanka is the little, uh, the little teardrop uh, below India. Um, and so uh, South India, it's right next to South India. You'll find a lot of the Tamils came from South India, immigrated over hundreds and hundreds of years. There used to be a land bridge between India and Sri Lanka. Uh, and even now you can see the land bridge uh, from a satellite photograph. But it was sort of, it, it was destroyed um, through, you know, erosion and uh, I think there was a tsunami there as well. Mm. So that's Sri Lanka. Population is about 25 million. 
It's about the same as Australia. Okay. But in a tiny uh, bit of space. Um, so almost we're the Tasmania of... of uh, With of 20 Australia. million overall. 25 million. 25 million. Yeah, in, in, in Sri Lanka, yeah. So it's... Uh, we like to differentiate ourselves from from India, um, but you know we got our independence from the British uh, soon after the the Indians got their independence. So that's the country. It's a it's a beautiful place and great tourist destination. So with the Tamil, uh, were you just brought by the British to uh, Sri Lanka? Were you part of like the chosen one, and the British brought you to Sri Lanka just to set up the uh, <laughs> life in Sri Lanka it's, is, a, it's, is, a, it's an interesting question okay. um, Tamils have always been in Sri Lanka we believe and it's probably going to be you're going to have viewers that uh, dis, uh, disagree but there's always been uh, wars between a Tamil kingdom and a Sinhalese kingdom which is the other which is the majority in Sri Lanka um, and you'll find that a Tamil king will reign in Sri Lanka for a generation and then Sinhalese king. But when the British came and colonized Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka was always colonized. It was colonized by uh, the Dutch, the Spanish, and so there's a lot of influence there. But the most recent is the British. And when the British came, they wanted to... There was a lot of opportunity there. And I, I feel because uh, the Tamils were a mi minority, and this is a a mixture between fact and my personal feeling. Um, Tamils took an opportunity to, to be educated, to opportunity to work with the British, take those roles, those opportunities in government, in, in business. So you're saying that you existed in Sri Lanka before the British came? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We, we would have immigrated from India. I, I truly believe even the Sinhalese would have been immigrated from India at some point. Hmm. Uh, and it's very fu interesting where... If you look at um, the, the the religion for for Sinhalese, they follow Buddhism. Now, Buddha was a Indian king, mm. right? And so, there's a lot of connection there between India and Sri Lanka and the people who immigrated or migrated from India. Um, but a lot of the challenges happen is when the British came, they they kind of gave this, but well, we had this opportunity to step up. Uh, and other challenge was as well is that because majority of uh, Sri Lanka who are Sinhalese were the landowners, were traditionally the tea plantation owners, the rubber plantation owners, and they typically were folk that worked the land and very, you know, they were quite happy doing that. Whereas the Tamils um, tend to, you know, we're working very closely with the British in those. So they were educated. They learned English much more. You'll find um, a, a greater population of, I would find, you know, Tamils were more focused on that space because they, they needed to differentiate themselves in their land. So you are the chosen one in Sri Lanka. <laughs> yeah. The, the, I wouldn't say the, that out loud in Sri Lanka. Yeah. We would, we would, no, I, I don't, well, I feel we're all chosen, um, but I think. The, Do you have the same color blood? Like, is it red or uh, it's blue? Same. We have the same color blood. We love the same color kind of food. We uh, we still, you know, when we fall and get cut and hurt, we uh, we still uh, cry and it's in pain. Um, so you're like the same, same as everyone else. So absolutely, we we speak. Uh, most Tamils will speak uh, um, Tamil and Sinhalese, um, and lots of times. You'll find Sinhalese and Tamils who end up getting married and have kids. Mm. Um, and uh, so, what was the reason of the start of the conflict with the two? It's an interesting. It's it's. I blame the Sing. Uh, I blame the um, the British. The British. I yeah. blame the British. They're very good amazing. At, uh, divide and conquering the world, and that's why they've been very successful. You know, um, uh, pushing that whole the British Empire. Uh, and one of the challenges is that it's a, it's, it, and I even think it's even more than that. It's about the educated and the non-educated within a, within, a, within a country. Uh -huh. I, I, I believe so. Is that, uh, when the British left, they left, uh, a, a really sour taste in, in the population. They did the same thing in India as well. Um, and what tended to happen was, 
when the world was going through challenging times from an economic perspective, it came down to um, the the masses were looking for opportunity to work in the city. Mm. A lot of those roles and a lot of the jobs are taken. And so politicians who came in started to rile up the 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 population to say, vote for me or, you know, we will give you those jobs. And they tend to put restrictions. So there was a lot of restrictions around Tamils. So X amount of Tamils, so it would have been, let's say, I don't know the exact numbers, but let's say one Tamil for every 10 Singhalese would go into university. So that's how it's, it, a lot of that started was around university, education, um, and... And nothing to do with religion whatsoever. No, no, no. it's not. It's, it's to do with politics, it's to do with bias, uh, and it's to do with, I guess, being desperate, human, as a human being, being desperate. You know, if you're not being able to pay for, can't feed your children or feed your family, then you put, in, you put yourself in a position that is very challenging. You know, it's, you have to do things that you normally wouldn't do to help your family and protect your family and feed your family. And so there's unscrupulous people out there that take advantage of that and starts to, I guess, churn the butter or churn the, the, the general consensus. It's so funny when I'm, when I sit down and hear your story, I'm just, it reminds me of the story of, um, I don't know, Palestine in Israel, the yeah. same format, same thing happened in Cyprus. Mm. So wherever the British reign, they left the place uh, with their division in some in some shape and, and I, I i believe it's it's a it's a strategy right it's, it's not just the british we we see that currently happening right if you look at um i'm very passionate from a political perspective and looking at i guess more about you know what the dynamic has been in a country in a world and how it's evolved in the last 5 years 10 years 100 years right and if you look at control the way that someone can control you is by disrupting the way you think and by alienating you from your community or your yeah. group of people, right? Your, your friends and family. And that's, we see that now, you know, with, with, um, every form of violence, whether that's local violence, whether that's international violence is about is other countries or other people who want to inflict power or get you to do something that they want you to do is the way to disrupt your values and disrupt the way that you do things, right? Yeah. And so we found that in Sri Lanka where politicians were getting involved because they wanted the power, they wanted the influence, uh, even to this right to this day, you know, Sri Lanka was controlled by families of politicians. You had a revolution last year, yeah? Someone, yeah, so there's been, someone else. So there was a massive a war between Tamils and Sinhalese. Uh, government, uh, and that's, that, you know, that's, that's ended, but there's still a sentiment of being uncomfortable, right? We don't know, you know, and I, I haven't been, I have not been to Sri Lanka in a while. Um, what's a while? What's it? 10 years? I 10 think. years. Yeah. Okay. Um, last time I went was for a holiday. Uh, actually a good friend of mine's, um, wedding. Uh, he's Australia, he's in Australia. Uh, he, you know, he met his wife a Sri Lankan and they decided to go back to Sri Lanka to get married. Yeah. Um, and that was the only time I've kind of been, and we get to hear a lot of information third hand by the news. And currently Sri Lanka is bankrupt. Um, they've defaulted on their uh, loans. And so the government is, you know, has been ousted. And there's so a new government there. Do you blame, do you still blame the British for even the corruption that's happening in Sri Lanka? Did they teach no. them even corruption? I don't think so. Did they? No, I, I, I just, I just feel that again, going back to power and influence, um, the way that you can influence someone is to figure out what are the, the, the pieces that, or the levers that you need to pull mm. to influence you, right? And, then you can step step back and watch. Uh, you can watch, you know, the downfall, I guess, of that person or yeah. that community or that group of people. Um, 
So I guess the British were good at that. And but I think it's 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 not just the British. I think it's humans in in general. You know, if you look about. Yeah, but le- let me ask you a question. Do we always have to blame someone? Like I'm, I'm hearing, for example, these days is a trend. Mm. Uh, whenever there is a conflict or a war, we always blame the Americans. You know, like it's all America. They're causing trouble and whatsoever. But the citizens of these countries, they never own anything. They never, they never have an initiative to build their countries. They sit back and wait for other people to get involved. And that's a really good question. Uh, and the high level is absolutely not. The only person you can blame is yourself, right? Uh, but there's a journey that you have to take as a person to go through that process of inspecting what's happened, what impact you've, you've played in the, in the, in the, in the story, in the narrative, and what you can do better to, to be better, you know, to help that narrative or to improve the way of life. And I go back to Sri Lankans. We are very resilient people, whether you're Tamil, whether you're Sinhalese. We are very resilient. Resilient because you don't have any other choice. Absolutely. But to be resilient, yeah? It's and a it's, survival game. And it's, guys. and it's something that as we've immigrated out of Sri Lanka and gone to the other parts of the world like the UK and the US and Australia, we've taken that resilience with us. Uh, even now, if you look at it, I talk to my cousins in, in, in affectionately we call Lanka, and they're like, yeah, you know, the world, the, the government, we're bankrupt, but we're still surviving. You know, you see queues of people waiting for petrol, but they still survive. Electricity, you know, cuts out midway through the day. They still survive. They still eat. They still have fun. They enjoy life there. You know, they, they, and so it's great when you put in a, a situation of, of pain and animosity, human beings have the ability, if they have the, the yearning for it to step out of it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I feel when you're not put in that position, uh, my personal opinion is that you become very lax. Look, I have a very complete different view. I think these people are really corrupted, not just politicians because they go and elect corrupted politicians. So, sure. and they got them and they so, um, adjust to the life. This is why they always blame other people for their, yeah. their for their problems so if i take you back to your early days in sri lanka what do you remember of those early days i remember my uh best mate nim uh he lives in london now uh i remember oh, he's gonna be so happy with you now yeah i remember you know ransom surprise surprise a lot of guys that i grew up with in down the street we used to play marbles um, you know, 6 p.m. we had to be home. We were study, study, yep. you know, which is a standard thing. Um, but before then we were, you know, giving a lot, of, giving a lot of autonomy. You know, we used to ride our bicycles around the locality. We used to, we used to, uh, you know, hang out with each other. It was a lot of fun. And, uh, I remember that. I remember, uh, my family and my extended family because we lived in a very big house with, yes. A few families. Um, so my dad's brother, um, you know, and his family. So we got, I was very close to my cousin, Claire. Um, uh, her mom's from Czech, Re- Czech Republic. Okay. Um, so Auntie Magda and, and, uh, it was really, it was a great life. It was a lot of fun. We used to, you know, go and fly kites at the beach, goal face. Um, we used to go horse riding. I remember um, the crazy parties my families used to have because we were quite, I guess, connected with politicians and police. And so all the, the big wigs would turn up at my the house. And we, as kids, we were asked to then go to our bedrooms to and not come out. I remember a lot of that. So was, everything was beautiful and happy and full of life. Yeah. Till the age of 10. Yeah. When... You suddenly find yourself found yourself in Australia. Mm. Just before you arrived to Australia, because at age of ten, people will still remember what happened with them. Of course, it's the early stage of their life where every like the memory will be really fresh, and they will memorize. So, did you feel the tension between the Tamils and so it's, the it's, other ethnic it's, groups it's before, a, like at this age? Absolutely not. Uh, and the other thing as well is we. We lived in Saudi, um, 
for a year. My dad used to work for Aramco and he was there for a few years as an engineer. Uh, and my, and we came and joined him, me and my sister, my mum. And my other sister was actually born there as well. Uh, and we then went back to Sri Lanka. Uh, and then we found ourselves, you know, leaving Sri Lanka and then coming to Australia. And it was really the behind of my parents wanting to, I guess, have more opportunity. You know, Sri Lanka was, you know, you were kind of put in a, in a, in a swim lane, right? If you were a, a guy, you were put in a particular swim lane. If you were a, 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 a female, lady, a yeah. female, you were put in a particular f- swim lane. And from our family perspective, you know, there needed to be other things. And I think my dad wanted to, you know, um, and there's a story behind that, but I'll tell you, I'll, I'll share that with you in another time. But we ended up, you know, in, in Australia, we, um, we kind of had to leave everything behind. Um, and even when we went from S- Saudi back to Sri Lanka, uh, there was a lot of change in the country. Um, I remember. Um, so did you feel the tension? Did you feel like there you have a we, pressure we on you guys kids. just live? We were young kids. We, did you ever ask your dad? No, not really. We, we just followed our parents. Wherever. Is it a taboo? Like you don't actually question your dad's decisions oh, and that's how, that's how it we is. We grew up in a very strict, very strict, very strict family, uh, discipline, very discipline. uh, education, never talk back to your parents. There's uh, always that, that common thing where it's seen and not heard, right? As kids growing up. And so you, you kind of grew up in that life and change was always happening. And we moved to Saudi. I, I did, I went to a school there. My sister went to school there. Um, and then we went back to Sri Lanka, you know, and my dad tried to do some business in there. Again, it's about, you know, surviving. It's about getting back on track, figuring out what's a stable sp- spot to kind of build a, a life in. But then we found ourselves back in, in, we found ourselves in Australia, you know, in Sydney. So now that you've grown up and you've seen, like, you, if you look back through your life, do you think you're, was it an easy choice for your dad just to leave his country and go to Australia? Or was it like? That's a really good question. Um, and the reality is that I don't think, I, I know it's, it wasn't. Mm. Um, I look at my mom and my dad. They had to leave, uh, I would say, a very comfortable lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Very comfortable. You know, it was, they grew up there. It was an established country. It's their motherland, right? Coming to Australia, my dad had to re-educate himself for Australian qualifications. My mom had to start working, so she had to start her own business, and she started to do uh, childcare. And my father became an Alice programmer, and you know he he, but he it was a really tough time while he was studying. You know, studying at nights, he worked for Australian Post during the day. To, to provide for his family. We lived in Bur- uh, Burlington Road in Homebush. That's how typically most Sri Lankans, when they immigrate, will end up there. Uh, and it was very tough for us. You know, it was, it was, it was very new. But I guess as children, it wasn't as stressful or crazy, right? Yeah. Because we had a little flat, you know, um, I think it was a two bedroom flat. I can't recall, but it was a, a tiny little flat. But it would have been a massive change for my mom and a massive change for and my massive mom. Because I remember one, once. How many times did they cry in front of you guys? Did they ever cry? My, mo- my mom was a person that was not uh, scared to show her emotions. Mm. Um, she, and she taught me how to, well, she, you know, that reflected on her kids. Uh, I feel we are a lot more emotionally connected. My father, on the other hand, no, he, he didn't. But you, but now as an adult, at my age now, after having a family, after having kids, after having all the challenges a father goes through, and I guess what life puts in front of you and, and, and what, you, what happens as a result, of the choices that you make, um, I have a lot more respect and a lot more understanding for the challenges my father went through. Uh-huh. Um, and, it's, and it's softened me immensely. Uh, whereas when I was much younger, I was, 
I guess, didn't understand him. So you kind of become angry yeah. at that person, right? Uh, you understand, you, you kind of think that you understand your mum more because you spend more time with your mum. Um, but another challenge as well, another dynamic is that, you know, my mum and dad didn't understand the challenges that we went through as kids, you know, growing up in a new country. They didn't have time. Really. Well, not just that, they, just they didn't ask our opinion, right? They didn't, <laughs> they didn't have bandwidth to, you know, how, how are you going, kids? You know, how is, what's the challenges? No, we had to fend for ourselves. Um, and, you know, we, we were, you know, I, I went to a bunch of different schools as we changed suburbs where we lived. You know, my parents were trying to get a better lifestyle. Um, and you, you go from a school where most of the people are Sri Lankans and Indians, uh, and, um, Mainly immigrants, you know, coming, coming to a school where, where the majority is actually that and the minority is probably more, you know, traditional Aussies, uh, mm. Anglo Saxon, Anglo Whereas if you look at where we ended up growing our majority of our time as teenagers, it was reverse, you know, and so you were put from one, from one, um, uh, space or environment to another and, Myself and my sisters and my brother, we had to evolve, right? And each one of us evolved in a different way. Uh, yeah. And now I respect that. I kind of understand the journey each one of them took. But yeah, personally, it was a massive... Uh, and my parents never understood. Only now in, in my age that I share that with them. But I guess even that they don't, they don't truly fathom the kind of challenges and pressures kids went through uh you know coming to australia as the first generation yeah maybe the expectation was really standard now your expectation is above the moon you just want everything for the best yeah or not really what do you between mean your expectation and their expectation they used to live a simple life yeah so my parents did not live a simple life in Sri Lanka. In Australia. But in Australia, yes, they did. Um, and it was very driven by their own philosophy because they come from a life of affluence to Australia and they kind of went, oh, it's, it's good. You know, we, we want to live a simple life, you know, quiet life. We don't want to really push, but we want our kids to be, you know, doctors, lawyers, 100%. Uh, accountants, yeah. right? Um, and that's what they wished. And they, they thought education was a, a good way for them to be successful in life. And success was defined by monetary. How know? much money you make. How much yeah. money, how much possession you have, material stuff. And they, they put all the effort and forced us or pushed us down that path, right? Um, but, the, but I feel now when I speak to my parents, they live a much more, I would say, content life. Um, in their old age and you know they they find happiness doing those little things so did they find themselves in australia after all of these years or they prefer to go back to sri lanka oh they love australia i think they'll never go back to sri lanka my my mom my mom does she has a a a, a very close group of uh school friends uh, my mom went to a methodist ladies college and so you know there's a there's a group of, I don't know, maybe 10 ladies. They're super close, uh, all around the world. And they tend to meet up in Sri Lanka every couple of years and they have a big, you know, get together. And, and it's great. So my mum's going there, I think, uh, early next year. Um, whereas my dad's become, you know, he's very, I feel very content in his life. He's very, I would say a bit reclusive. Um, but he's happy doing what he does. Did he give up? Do you think he gave up? It's, this is a really, yeah. this is getting, this, <laughs> <laughs> this is getting deep and meaningful. I love it. Um, my personal opinion is yes. Yes. I feel that, um, and it's a very different dynamic to, to how I guess my mom went through. My dad would have had to deal with racism in Australia, you know, have to deal with a lot of that pressure. There's a lot of challenges. Um, and I think he got to a point where, um, you know, he had to, he retired early. Um, he got to a point where I guess he just didn't want to deal with it, with, uh, working in corporate life, mm -hmm. being a immigrant and working in, you know, a place where, um, 
racism and uh, bigotry is is rampant in uh, Australia. In Australia, and the land of opportunities. Oh well, you know, I Australia is a is a, is a good a great country. It's a safe Fantastic country. country yeah. We're safe because no one really wants to take us over because I guess we've got too much land masses. I guess the Japs tried that. Japanese tried that in uh, World War Two. Yeah, that didn't work out too well. But I think we are ring fenced as a as a nation, and we're protected from the rest of the world. Yeah, we True. talk about Australia and uh, in reality. Yeah, down the track. Yeah. So tell me something. Your parents, if you, if you look back now, oh, have you ever asked like, not ask them specifically? Do you think they would have a different personality if they were if they stayed in Sri Lanka and not left their country? Would they be a different people? Um, what did they gain? What did they lose? I don't. I don't believe that. I believe my father is my father, and my mum is my mum. Regardless, regardless, and their personalities have always been there. And um, it's interesting. I think me and you have had this conversation before. Um, they're very fierce in what they believe in, and they've always been like that. My dad's very fierce in the way he thinks, in the way he actions, the way he goes to. I would call goes to market, and my mum's the same. You know, she's. So that hasn't changed. That 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 energy, that fire, stubbornness, that yeah. that um, ability to say, "This is the course I'm taking in life." Everyone else can just, you know, move up, move yeah. over, right? Yeah, yeah. That hasn't changed. It's still that the same. Changed. Well, this is why they go through uh, all of these wars and conflict and clashes. Yeah. So. Enough of your family, really, because um, <laughs> I think we did speak about them really in details. Um, all respect to them, by the way, because what they've been through is not easy. I've been through it, yeah. and my family has been through it, and I don't think it was easy. I, I don't actually wish it to anyone. Leaving the country and going to different places is against my beliefs and values. It doesn't matter how much money you make in different places. Stay in your land, stand in your homeland as much as you can. But you came here at an age of 10. Yeah, yep. that's right. With the name of Arabin Kuramasawi. Kumaraswami, correct? Kumaraswami. Kumaraswami. So you told me Kumaraswami 20 yeah. times. Yeah. And I still don't actually the get it. Tank Christa. The king of gods. <laughs> <laughs> well, the king of gods. So if you if you if you break the name up, and I, this is my own, uh, I guess the way I look at it is Kumara is like king, and Swami is 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 a god. So it's interesting. But the Kumara Swami name is from my grandfather, and we've kind of kept that name going. Um, and all my cousins uh, kept that name. My 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 family, my siblings, have kept the name. So. And it's what my kids have as well. My kids use that Kumara Swami name. Fantastic. Yeah. So let me take you back to when you were 10 years old. Yeah. Arabin Kurama Swami. Yeah. He came to Australia. Yeah. The land of white people. Um, they actually know only one language, which is English, to some extent. Just with your name, how much, how much did you struggle with just your name? when you used to present yourself as a kid. And that's a good thing. And I don't think it's unique to me in my experience, but uh, we in Australia, it's very common to transform your name into something that's uh, palatable and something that's easily said. So so from Arabin to Bindi. To Bindi, yeah. So I'm, I've am i been known it's close. as Bindi since I was a young child. Young it's really close. Mm. So... And it's something that even even as a uh, in corporate, when I, the years I spent in corporate, I've been well known as Bindi, right? So I don't like it. And for a long time, uh, my car had number plates called Bindi. So it was it became my brand. It became who I was. And you can either stick and say, you know, my name is Arabin Kumar Swami. Get over it and you know get used to it, or you can change. Go with the flow. Well, you can you can. Yeah. You can change the way that you go to market or the way that you see yourself or how it's other so people funny see because uh, when I came from um, from my country, people call me Roland. Roland is like a French name, yeah. Roland. But 
no one in Australia can say Roland. No one. Seriously, like no one. So suddenly I became Roland overnight. And it took me years to adjust myself. Like, it's just a... But that's the way it is, I guess. Um, and it, it's a struggle just with your name because your name is your identity at the end. Did you feel that you have to prove yourself all of these years? Do you have to work extra, like, and to make an additional effort to prove yourself just because you come from a different country? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not just because I come from a different country. It's because I'm a unique soul. I'm different. I'm not like everyone else. And well, you're from the King of God's uh, <laughs> family. I love it. Um, that's going to be my new handle. Uh, look, the, the thing is, lots of times I remember um, growing up, I had to fight for my space. I had to fight for my identity. And sometimes, even at school, the fights got violent. You know, Did I had you have to, to fight for your color too? Absolutely. I remember lots of times having in, in physical alteration, altercations with, you know, my school friends and it, it became very violent and my parents never knew about that, but you had to fight for who you are, right? Uh, I, because I saw lots of times of people of my culture or Sri Lankans and Indians who immigrated to Australia who didn't fight, who were always bullied, who were always picked on, who were always treated uh, differently. Uh, because of the name, because they can't speak English properly. One of the things I was very proud of was I grew up in a country where English was the first thing the I first, learned. Yeah, exactly. I can't speak Tamil very well. I can't speak Sinhalese very well, but I can speak English very That's well. That's an advantage too. So we were educated, you know, in English. Mm. And my parents spoke English. Um, and when you came here, lots of times you, you get you get put in a bucket. Uh, I would say not just a bucket, a pit <laughs> by the the local folk. And then you kind of have to fight your way out of that pit. And the ones who didn't, I saw that. They struggled, right? They would get picked on at school. You know, they would get bullied. They would get really nasty stuff. Whereas me, I would, because I was, I was, I was a skinny kid. Then I was a chunky kid. Then I became a built up kid growing up. When I became that built-up kid, the transition from when I went from a skinny kid to, you know, built and can defend myself and grew, I had a growth, growth spurt and became quite tall and people stepped back and they would see me and go, okay, that's Bindi. And Bindi came with a bunch of prerequisites, right? Don't mess with him. Don't, you know, treat him badly. He's, he, he's assimilated into the way that we want to live, right? But then I saw people who struggled with that, you know, and that affected their their journey in life. So how much did it impact you mentally, just to prove yourself on a constant basis? Since you were a kid till now, I think you're still going through that now. I'm still proving myself. I'm still fighting that fight. It's tiring. It's exhausting. Uh, you kind of look at other people and go, um, oh, you know, why are you always defensive? Why are you always having this aggressive personality why do you always push forward why are you always loud why are you always um I, I should I tell you an interesting one my uh niece uh my sister rather's daughter nala she t says to me always uncle billy why are you so loud and it's interesting it's just who, who i've had to become and even to this day it's it's built into my dna now where if i'm not in a defensive stance, if I'm not, you know, it's how I grew up. It's all I've known. So do you, do you like to hear your voice always? Like, does it give you comfort that you exist? Is this what it is? It's a combination of that and a combination of uh, growing up in a family of six people who all were very passionate and emotional and all, and to be heard, you have to be loud. Um, and it's interesting. I, I first time I realized that other families are not loud is when uh, I met my um, other half, my ex other half, ex other half, yeah, um, and her household was much quieter, right? And even for her, it was it was a massive. I, I feel a, 
uh, culture shock or, or a shock where we were all loud and our voice got louder when we had to prove something or say something. Um, so yeah, so I think it's a combination of growing up in the you know western suburbs of of, of uh, Sydney. So I grew up in Campbelltown, Macquarie Fields. Oh my god, the hood, the hood. Uh, and you know, uh, my, I guess my ex wife grew up in you know, you know more central sort of near Parramatta, Eastwood, Penner Hills area. So there's a there's a difference. There's I a guess. clash in uh, there's a, there's a social difference. correct and there's levels. a conformity there. Whereas our family's always been um, pushing the envelope, right? We kind of we don't we don't look at the status quo. We go, what's how is it going to work for me? Uh, and we disrupt the status quo. And I've always been a disruptor in my life, and I've done that. I've been able to monetize that working for you know Microsoft and Salesforce and working with tech companies and and startups and and I I started my first tech business when I was 17 years old. Here we get to this. Yeah. So you went through school here, you went to uni. Um, nothing could stop you, really. You just want to prove yourself. Yeah. Your family was pushing you. And then what happened? You start working here in Australia? Yeah. It's. Uh... Do you remember your first interview? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I remember... I ex I remember every. How many times were you knock knocked out? Like they say, oh, okay, maybe because of your it's, color. It's, or a, your it's an interesting one. So let's take a step back mm. before I started working. Um, you know, I did the usual typical Sri Lankan uh, expectations for my parents. So I did uh, four in maths, physics, chemistry, engineering at uni. I mean, at school for my HSC. I didn't do it very well. Uh, I kind of went through a, 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 a motion where I was rebelling, you know, I was a rebel against uh, conforming against my parents' wishes. So um, I didn't do very well, but I ended up getting into university anyway. I uh, got a Bachelor of Science degree, major in physics. But that... I, in that, physics? In physics. Uh, I, la I lasted doing that for about uh, one and a half years, and then I transferred to a Bachelor of Commerce I started to figure out who I was and I wanted to define success back then with the amount of wealth I can acquire, uh, mm. accrue. Scientists don't get paid very well in Australia. So those are kind of motivations. I well, want. educated people don't get paid, paid Correct. Correct. in Australia. You have to, you have to really be a tradie or well, do something. And we can, we can, we can unpack that a little, a little later on. So when I, my first job, I was at uni part-time, so I was going at uni at nights, and my first job was, uh, I used to work, I used to drive, I used to be a delivery driver for uh, a company, a restaurant called Pink Diamond in Campbelltown. I I remember everything. I remember the guy who hired me. I used to remember doing the deliveries, and that used to pay for, you know, school books and things like that, and I remember, you know, my chili chicken that uh, they would always have that prepared for me when I when I finished my shift. And then I my first real job was working at a company called Strathfield Car Radios. I remember that and a guy called Tony Letty. He was my first uh I guess mentor and he taught me sales. I, I watched him how he sold. Uh, and my first job was that I was a sales representative for the Campbelltown store. Are you still in contact with Tony or? I haven't, I haven't seen Tony in years. Yeah. Um, but back then he helped shape, I guess, the guy I'm now and, uh, you know, my success as a, in, in sales, right? Yeah. But that was my, I remember that. I remember that really well. Um, and that was a great experience for me because when I worked for Stratford Car Radios, I was there for about five years. I learned how to sell. Um, they used to call me the Apco King. I used to be able to, I used to get people, I used to sell a stereo system that was maybe two or three times more expensive than the car that the person drove and it was all financed. So they called me the Apco King. Um, and I loved it. It was a great experience that then formulated my, my brand and who I was. It defined who I was. And that's how I felt, right? Mm. Um, and it was good. I was also, I was that I had that hustler mentality. I was um, buying and selling cars from pickles auctions on the side, fixing them up with my dad. So you're a car salesman. I am. I am an entrepreneur. My entrepreneur. mindset is always 
um, there's a great uh, analogy, ABC, yeah. always be closing. And that's the mantra of my life. So you've been through, um, and then you progress, you work with Salesforce, Microsoft, mm. you did a lot of, um, I don't know, um, investment, you succeeded in your, in your life, you proved yourself, which is good. I'm hearing this and I've heard this so many times with my guests and other people that I know. But I really want to hear your point of view because I don't have the same color that you do. And do you remember the first meeting you had? Like, were they expecting you to be the way you are? Were they shocked? Did, did you feel any kind of, I don't know, like, uh, were they surprised who they were dealing with or you don't feel it in Australia? Um, I've, I've never let it hold me down. I've always been a person that has been loud. And I guess I get that from my uncle. Um, and, um, I've always known what I wanted. Now that's always come at a cost. And I've learned over the years that every choice that you make, you turn left, then you miss out on the stuff that you, you know, you could have got when you turn right. So there's always choices. And I, I've made, uh, I guess look back now, I've made good choices and bad choices, but I've always defined myself as this person, Bindi, this, uh, persona. So when I go to work, I'm a particular persona. When I'm at home, I'm a particular persona. But at some point, but do you, do you have a split personality? So to some extent, absolutely. Um, but over time that all merged into one and that's where I kind of lost the real Bindi, the, the, the beating heart or the person that's inside me. Um, and I became more focused on defining successes. So hold on. So when you lost your inside or lost your heart, you became the real Bindi. No, when, no. I, when I, 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 I lost that, that softness. So lots of people would say, and people who know me all my life, I might be a big, strong guy that's, you know, uh, that's looks outwardly looks quite aggressive. Inwardly, I'm very soft and gentle, but at some point that gentle person kind of disappeared and I became very focused on my career, you know, making more, doing more, being very aggressive with what I want to achieve, travel the world, um, you know, and my, I guess it impacted my family. So it impacted my relationship. So why is that? Why? Why? What was the turning point? What happened with you? And it's funny. It's, it's not funny. I guess it's something everyone goes through. You start, your paycheck starts to triple and quadruple and 10 times more than what you've had in, you know, in the space of five, six years and you start going, wow, like, so you, you, you're, so you couldn't absorb it really. So well, you're not, you're not taught. You, you don't have the skill set to, to manage, to understand the power of money and what money does. Right. And I truly believe that money corrupts you. If you don't have the skills to fight that corruption, right. To, to change, to stay true to who you are. Mm. So we grew up from, I guess, relatively, uh, simple, extremely simple life where my parents used to always argue about money and bills and all that kind of stuff to me driving Porsches, you know, going into a dealership, buying a $200,000 sports car and not thinking twice about it, you know, and mm. my wife would want, uh, her Mercedes and boom, we just literally it went to a life where we were earning so much and buying houses. And, um, I remember we bought three houses in one year. And that's crazy. And I would have been in my thirties. And so we went through that and we thought, you start to think that you're invincible. I have this, I, I got this feeling that I was invincible. And I feel that life has a way of getting you back down. So you me. felt that you are a real God now. Yeah. yeah. You have this God status that nothing can touch you. Right? Uh, How can you buy three houses in uh, one year in Australia? Were you dealing or were you just doing <laughs> I was dealing in software uh, in, uh, and, uh, well, in, and not just me. I mean, my, my wife back then, of course, she's yeah. a phenomenal person. She's a CFO and she's, you know, together we were uh, that power couple, right? We were, 
you know, new cars every couple of years, you know. Tr- I remember we had our third child um, and we just went overnight. We went, we're going to Europe. So me and her jumped on a plane literally within a couple of weeks and my mom looked after, my mom and my in-laws looked after my kids and we did a world tour for one month. We went to France, we went to, uh, we, we ate at the Jerusalem restaurant, the Eiffel Tower, just like that. Mm. So you start to become, your ego grows massive. I think it grew so much that I needed a, a trailer to carry my ego around. And then, you know, things start to unwind. Because I don't think it's, now I feel it's not healthy for a human being to have such a ego. ego. And the humility piece, which I had when I was younger, I, I missed. Uh, and it started to change, I guess. So you human are really confusing. If you don't have money... You pray to God to give you money. Hmm. Once you have the money, you can't handle the money. You blame God for giving you the money, and then you don't control your life. So I <laughs> What's never, going on? I never blame God for anything. So I'm a spiritual person, uh, very spiritual. I grew up in a very spiritual home. Um, it was never that me. It was me going, just pushing myself like a train to be successful and defining my life, what success meant. And the reality is that for me back then, success was money. It was wealth and power, walking to nightclubs, walking into a dealership, buying cars, you know, all that kind of providing for my kids, my son went to Kings, all that kind of stuff. But that's not but who I But then you missed now. on the basics. The basics, which is what happiness is, right? And now I think about my life back then and I think, wow, I really <laughs> messed up because now I've become a completely different person, right? I've, I've taken, I've gone through a tough time and I've gone through all, a lot of what I guess my own doing and w- what I put myself into and what I put my family through and, you know, put that situation. And then now I'm a much more simpler person. Um, you know, for me, material things is not a big thing. Um, I love, I changed my lifestyle completely. Uh, I'm a different person. And for me, I feel happiness in that. When I wake up now, you know, I don't have to worry about, you know, all of the pressures I used to have. So building money doesn't make people happy? I, I'll tell you what. They tell you that at uni, actually, they, they, you might think that money makes you happy, and that's what I was always led to believe growing up. And I can tell you now, it doesn't. It's uh, Material possessions is, is, is no good. It's, uh, and look, it's my personal journey. Uh, I know a lot of my mates, they live a very humble life and they're doing very well, you know, um, but they're happy, you know, they travel, they do you know, what they need to do. Whereas I, and they've always told me that I've always been that guy that, you know, goes 10 times more than what it needs to, right? Uh-huh. Um, but now, yeah, it's... Money doesn't make you happy, mate. I can tell you now. You're not the first one who told me this, by the way. And hopefully, and I won't be the last one. Yeah, the young generation will understand this. It's not just about the money. Money is important. You have to survive, but don't be haunted by money because you will destroy your life. But can I say something? One, one thing I'm going to say when you talk about this generation, if I look at my own kids, um, is that my kids are. Uh, become people, young people that I wish I was at their age. Beautiful. So my kids now are not focused on money. They don't, they've already said that. They, they don't have to. They, they just, they, they can do whatever they like to do. And it's for them, it's not about earning, you know, you know, crap loads of money every year. It's for them, it's about doing what they love. So my oldest son is very passionate about what he does. And, you know, uh, for me, my my call, my, I guess part of me goes, oh man, you know, he's not going to be able to buy a house with the kind of income that he's earning, but he's actually happy. Happy. He's content with his life. He's healthy. He's fit. He's helping other people. Uh, and the same thing with my daughter Zara, and you know, and I'm sure Russia and my youngest one will be the same. You know, it's and it's great. And it's I think it's a combination of. Power to my ex-wife who, you know, who I guess she was the first person to say, hey, we are becoming something that we shouldn't be. We're becoming crazy animals who are chasing money. So she raised the alarm. 
she raised the alarm. And, and you I didn't, didn't listen. I didn't listen, right? And that caused a lot of problems. And, you know, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm divorced. And the, and she's been instrumental in kind of getting the kids, you know, living a life that's more stable. And, you know, it's not, I, I'm, I would say back then I'm the most unstable person. You know, you know, one weekend I'm like, let's go to France, you know? So it's like, book a ticket. I've done it already. So now it's more consistency. She's providing that for the kids and that's phenomenal, right? That's, that's good. That's a good base for them. And it's something that I couldn't do and she's had to take the steps. Now, and and uh, to see my children and hear about my children doing these things that they're happy, it, it's, it makes me happy as well, right? It's great. But it's, it's also... It's funny how people change with with time. But, but, but the thing is, it's a, it's a battle that I'm constantly having every day, yeah. right? I'm When I wake up in the morning, I have to tell myself, this is the new Bindi. This is the guy that makes me happy. And sometimes I think, you know, oh, you know, those those old bindi ways starts to creep and i've got to push back that's a battle that i'm having these days back then it was a battle to you know compete with uh you know the typical australian compete in corporate life to you know prove yourself constantly and you would know this as being a salesperson you're constantly on review. You're constantly having to prove yourself. Constantly on the edge. Yeah. You're only as good as your last deal. Just that mentality is such an aggressive mentality. And I think most people don't understand that who are not in sales. You are only as good as your last deal. Okay. That, so yeah. Just in the corporate life, um, what do you, what was your take out of the corporate life in general? I think from a high level, it's it's a very it's a very dangerous place to be. Um, if you're not in the right mindset, it can lead you astray, uh, and you get to a point where you lose who you are. You know, you start working more, you start to travel more, you start to chase things that don't make sense for yourself. Mm. And you get caught to the corporate culture. There's a massive corporate culture in every country. In Australia, it's a very aggressive corporate culture. Very aggressive. Uh, I, I imagine it's changed over the years. But when I was there, it was, you know, you had to to eat in the, on the table. You had to be aggressive. Yeah. And it, it, it changes you. Loyalty? No such thing. And that's one thing I always... I find myself being a very loyal person and I, I respect loyalty more than anything else. And I respect honesty and transparency. But I, one thing I realize is you're only as good as the last day. <laughs> you know, there's no such thing as loyalty, uh, especially in corporate life. You know, I was, um, cause during my corporate life, uh, they always used to tell me never burn bridges. Well, what do you think about that? Hmm. I am a big fan of burning bridges, burning bridges that you don't want to go back to. Cause really stuff them. No, not like that. It's what is more, it? not about them. It's more about me. Um, I, I went through a phase where I guess I burnt bridges where, you know, if I look backwards now, it's, it's, it's a, it's a good way. Cause I don't want to go back to corporate, that corporate way. I've redefined who I am and I work with, with, in, within companies where I'm happy, with, I'm very comfortable in the culture and the way that, you know, the business runs, right? So you'll never find me going back to the big corporate behemoths. Um, because, you know, it's a mixture of I burnt bridges and I've also changed my mindset in terms but of But do you really want to just cross the same bridge that you've already crossed in your life? Australia, uh, in the corporate world that I've been used to, everyone's scared to burn bridges. <laughs> everyone's terrified to be there themselves. Everyone's terrified to, you know, bring their A game or their, their, who they are to the forefront. And I always say, you always say the tiger isn't, you can't change the tiger's the stripes, right? Uh, a tiger will always be a tiger. You jump into a pit and there's a tiger, it's going to eat you. You can't say, oh, the tiger is going to be nice and say, not going to eat you. So I, you, you can't, you, you get exhausted, you get tired 
of constantly having to trans become a different person at home, different person when you go out, different person when you work, different person, you know, when you meet relatives, different person with your in-laws. You can't. You got to be that one person and. I such a Australia, such a fake environment to be in. In Australia, it's 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 exhausting. Uh, but I don't think it's just in Australia. I think in just the world. Yeah, it's you know? all over it's, the place. You can feel it here in Australia. There's no loyalty. You yeah. can work with the same people for years and years, and suddenly the day you leave, they don't actually remember you. I think I think that's true for majority. And but then there's also a. I have a close knit of friends that I have developed over the years that I met while at Microsoft and at Datacom. Uh, and shout out to those guys is that they've been my closest mates from, from that point. When I'm going through challenges in life, you know, they've always been there to be. Yeah, everyone out. has this, this one or Correct. two friends you Correct. always care with your love. But overall, this is, that's yes. how it is. Absolutely. Now, there's another thing that really amazes me always in the corporate world is when you receive the, the email once a year, if you are okay, are you okay? Oh, yeah. Personally, I had those emails. Please don't send me these emails. Mm -hmm. well, what is your perspective on that? On the are you okay email that you get once a year? Yeah, I agree with you on that. Um, I think mental health is a big challenge in the world and especially in Australia. Uh, we have a tall poppy syndrome. It's still re it's still common. It's still there. Hundred um, percent. People are always. I feel through my experience in life, they'll cut you down when there's an opportunity, uh, and so and then you you'll see them the next day say, "Are you okay?" Yeah, because it's part of corporate culture. It's become it's become mainstream now. You know, it's driven by corporates. It's div driven by that culture that you know. Hey, we are striving to be better people. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter the follow through. It's just run behind the brand. Okay. Now, if you said to someone, no, I'm not okay. How many people do you think would react? Zero. They will all disappear. They'll disappear. They're like, oh, oh okay. Um, here's a number to call. <laughs> right. Because no one is, no one is committed to, to figuring out what's happening or walk a mile in someone's shoes. Right. Yeah. But you're running behind, and I see that recently. Where so please inundated. stop sending those emails. <laughs> we hated, no one likes them. We know it's all fake. We know it, hundred percent. I think, I think, but but you get caught up in their social, you know, thing. Like I, I got tons of on my Instagram account, on my Facebook, on my LinkedIn profile. Are you okay? Yellow and every, <laughs> yellow everywhere. Are you okay? Is should be the core of the reason why are you okay is to teach people that don't have a good relationship with their fellow humans to go and have a relationship with them and to figure out because we're all humans right and it's it's always interesting as salesperson you sell to a person you don't sell to a company and so you are taught to build a relationship with a person to understand that person figure out what that person is motivation that's how a successful salesperson is. So you already know how that person feels. I have good clients of mine who have become friends of mine and they will call me and they will talk to me and they'll listen to what I have to say. If I'm feeling bad, if I'm feeling low, they'll listen. And I feel the majority of human beings in this world, they just fall behind marketing campaigns, right? Um, and to, to, the whole reason why are you okay is to start a conversation, right? And the conversation is you listen. You got two years to listen and one mouth to talk. Yeah. So you're double the time you got to listen. But most people don't have bandwidth to listen. Yeah, no, they should. I think they should come up with something different now. We're sick and tired of this are you okay uh, bullshit that we always receive. Uh, I think we can upset a lot of people. This is reality. They need to understand that. Um, people are, are not numbers, yeah? And stop treating your employees as numbers. People are not numbers. They're humans. They have families. They have pressure. And um, the more they're happy in the environment they work in, the more they produce. Mm. Have you met a lot of people who try to justify their positions and not, not really providing to the company what they claim 
to provide. Um, you get to meet people in your journey and you get people who are truly authentic. And then you get to meet people that are just saying they're authentic or, or but their, their end game is to justify their existence or justify their role or validate to themselves. And you get to meet those people. And unfortunately, you know, that's life. It's, you know, we're not all made the same. And so, um, but going back to, you know, about corporate is that it's become such a challenge is that to maintain consistency, there's this, these boundaries that everyone has to live in. Right. Uh. And as, as human beings, we're not, we're not designed to be contained, you know? So yeah. It, no, we just have to be creative. Mm. Yeah. And I feel that's what's causing a lot of happen unhappiness in, in workplace in workplace and mental health going crazy. And, um, yeah, but yeah, you get to meet a lot of people and you get to see that as you get older, you get to, you get to see those people and you get, and they haven't, and people haven't really, the narrative is the same. Um, you know, you get to expect that and you become quite, yeah, as a, as myself, you know, being a, a gentleman that I feel that has lived through a lot, you can't to, you, you tend to be angry with society, but the thing is, it's about growth and I feel that I've grown out of that, but yeah, you, you get to pick those people That's out. Good. That's good. They, they tend to be, you want to stay away from that negativity, right? Negativity. Toxic people. Yeah. Who are just destroying big corporates. And in sales, it's actually, and I guess for the audience out there, you kind of, you don't realize the life of a salesperson. Same as I don't realize the life of, a, say, a, a, a surgeon, right? But as salespeople, you know, we're constantly having to reinvent ourselves. We're constantly having to be resilient. I've had the word said to me, you're not resilient, uh -huh. but I'm a sales guy. I'm always resilient. I've always had to be resilient. Uh, when a deal doesn't go the way, because you get paid on the back of a closed deal. When a deal doesn't go your way, how do you, what do you do? Do you go home and cry? No, you, you can go home and cry and then you get back into it and you get, move on. You get moving. 100%. So, I think a salesperson, there's a lot of complexity in their life. And Bindi, we've been talking for, uh, I don't know, more than an hour now. It went <laughs> over an hour. Yeah. And I would love to keep on talking with you for, I don't know, for a few hours. just want to talk a bit about your uh, personal life. Yeah. Really. I just want to open this this door. That, um, and I'm not sure if you're comfortable in talking about your personal life, but let's try to just to get something out of it as much sure. as we can. You are a fighter. You always, uh, you're so resilient. I know you, you just, you, you fell, just, you stand up, you keep on going, keep on moving, you fight, you don't give up. You, you went through a lot of, uh, ups and downs. You admitted that you couldn't handle a lot of money and you destroyed your life. Um, a lot of people will be just listening to you now and watching you and they want to get something out of it. Mm. What do you advise these people, money or work? Because money and work, they don't actually mix. That's my personal point of view. If you want to work and then you'll be a slave to your work, you will destroy your family. Is this true? Is this what you've been through? I absolutely believe that. And that's very true. I guess the, the learning, what I've learned through my experience is be authentic to yourself. Not to anyone else. You don't need to be authentic to anyone else. Um, be authentic to yourself and be who you are always. Whether you have money, whether you don't have money, whether you've got family, kids, whether you're single, divorced, whatever it is, be authentic to yourself and find happiness in being who you are. And I find people who really understand that, they have a better experience with life. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's something I've learned. Um, and it's interesting. I think, uh, my most, most recent experience with, uh, challenges that life throws at you is, you know, spending time in, in ICU, you know, for a month, one month in ICU. And I've got photographs that my mom and extremely thankful for my mom and dad for being there by my side is where she's taking pictures where I've been, you know, 
got pop the tubes in my mouth and my nose and can't breathe and all this kind of thing. Yeah, I've seen proof, so I'm going to show them to the viewers. Yeah. And I remember uh, when I was when I was going to surgery and I was in so much pain, I couldn't breathe and, you know, uh, I had serious complications and I had surgeons, like three or four surgeons around me and I couldn't talk, um, couldn't breathe properly. And the thing I was thinking was for myself is to calm my inner, my inner soul, my energy inside and, and become content with the outcome. And one of the things I kept telling myself is trust the process. What's the pro process? Because as a salesperson, as an entrepreneur, I'm always aggressively managing the process and the outcome. But this is like a, a good example of where I was able to manage myself and trust the process. And look, it's been, you know, I, 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 I lost, I went from 109 kilos down to 75 kilos while in the hospital. I couldn't eat or drink. It's it only recently have I been able to take the tubes out of my my nose. Even now I have a lisp because there's damage done to my nerves and, and nervous system and things like that. Um, but I've been able to go, hey, I've been through this challenge and and I've been walk I've been able to kind of continue living life because I've trusted the process, I've trusted people around me. I've not tried to be uh manage the outcome because sometimes you just can't you yep. just can't manage the outcome look i would say uh, you were one of the lucky people because you had your parents who stayed with you imagine if you didn't have your parents you would be on your own going through all of this absolutely. struggle absolutely and it's uh disappointing it, it was a scary situation to be because i had got to a point in my life where I had burnt a lot of bridges. I've hurt a lot of people with my actions and behavior. And so people have cut me off. And the only person, I guess, who turned up was my mom. And I remember she was there by my side from day dot, you know, um, when I was in surgery, when they were cutting me open and taking stuff out. And she was there, you know, in the operating theater, in the viewing room. And, you know, she's she's been a very, she's a tough, feisty person. Um, and I gotta say, you know, that's phenomenal. And having yeah. parents who can do that, and even having parents still alive, being able to be healthy enough to do that is phenomenal, right? It's a, it's a blessing. Thank you, mom. I do. I do. Yeah. We have a very complicated relationship, me and my mom. Um, cause she had me very young. Um, I think she would have been 19 or 20 when she had me, but, um, yeah, power to all the moms and dads out there. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, two more questions for you. Go for it. I love it. You happy with Australia? Where Australia is these days? It's interesting. I don't know if I'm going to get deported by <laughs> answering this question, but I'm an Australian citizen. Um, to be honest with you, I think I, my personal journey has taught me where I'm looking for different things in my life now. And for me, my life is yearning for a different lifestyle. Um, and to be honest with you, I don't think Australia can give me that lifestyle. I've been looking at going back to Sri Lanka and doing starting my business there, doing something there and helping that economy, but being in a place where I feel ha happy in my space. But again, I haven't explored that. It's, it's still a, maybe it's a fantasy, right? Maybe Sri Lanka is not the place that it used to be. But I've found myself doing a lot of research, spending a lot of time, watching um content creators that are exploring the different parts of the world um you know there's a lot of things that i'm looking at where i want to do outside of australia i want to go and travel and i want to explore the world and find some mechanism to fund that um and lots of times people go you know you know retirement to super all that stuff like when i you know i made a lot of bad financial mistakes with my super as well and you know and I lost it and all this kind of stuff. And I've had to rebuild my life again from scratch. But the good thing is it, I feel like I was 18 again. Or yeah. I'm 18 again, That's good. 17 again, where it's all new stuff. Yes, you know, the, the knees creak a bit and the back hurts a bit. But 
Um, so I you're really to... disappointed where Australia is now, to some extent. Uh, you're not the only one. But I think Australia, absolutely. I think we are a nanny nation. We are so, we are even scared of our own shadows. And we start, you know, we start to put laws into place that because of a, a bunch of bad eggs, you know, we kind of make everyone else, you know, fall to that space. Um, but if you look at all the other countries like the US and the UK, they're going through the same challenges. Yeah, they're not you doing to, any better. You go to the UK now, racism is rampant. It's always been rampant. Now it's bubbled to the <laughs> surface. Australia is the same. You know, we're, we are a racist country. It's just, you know, it's just the, 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 the DNA of this country, yeah. right? And we are, we're, but we are made by, you know, a very tight, very dangerous connection of immigrants, right? We all come from different parts of the world, bring our, our pain to this table, you know, to this country, uh, and that causes conflict. 100%. You know? um, if you were to stay, say, in Sri Lanka or, or anywhere else where you're originally from, it's a different conversation that you're going to have, right? Um, so hopefully they will deport you soon. But I have my kids here, so my three kids, I, I, I live for them. They're, they're, you know, they're phenomenal. I'm very proud of them. But, you know, at the same time, I went through a point where after I got divorced, I was like, oh, you know, I need to be close to my kids. I need to. But then again, now I, I think about it. They're now young adults and they're growing and they've got their own life and they're going to make their own mistakes. And, you know, I don't need to be babysitting them mm. like the nanny nation we live in Australia. So now, you know, it helps me kind of. The think nanny about, nation. Amazing. I mean, we are, we are highly regulated. We are, uh, everything is. Yeah, tracked. it's becoming a communist country more than anything else. And I think that, I think, I don't know how much the average Australian realizes that there's no such thing as privacy. Being a person in the tech space that worked with, you know, a lot of those companies that, so a lot of the government agencies, like defense and like New South Police and all that stuff, who can track everything that you do, the car that you're driving, who's in the car, check your IP, your IP, address, all that kind of stuff. Because you, I've been in tech, I got to see a lot of that stuff. Yeah, there is no such thing as privacy. They're insecure. Man. It is. They live on the edge. They feel like one day someone will just come and occupy Australia. Well, one of it is, I think, but it's also to do with society. I think we've become a a, a, a a place where everyone is so protected by kid gloves. You know, um, we haven't really, you know, if you look at my parents and we talked about this before, myself, you know, my sisters and my brother, we, probably more of my sisters and, and, and me and my parents coming to Australia, we've had to change. We have to go through a massive amount of change, big shocks, but Society nowadays, because we're so global, we get to see the rest of the world. You know, nothing really impacts, you know, so there's a, well, I feel, you know, young people nowadays, they're bored. And now we're seeing more challenges happening with young people where because they're bored, they're not, there's no real direction. There's no core values. You know, you're, you're starting to see, you know, big impact society is going to have to deal with that. All right. Bindi, what do you regret the most in your life? Um, being the loss of, I guess the, I regret the most is the degradation of my relationship with my ex-wife because we were like best mates. And then because of the way life changed and, you know, it allowed to change me and, and she was able to see it much earlier. I regret that um, having to live life without i guess that that partnership that relationship and then as a result the relationship the poor relationship i have with my kids as a result and they only see me as that guy you know who drives the brand new sports car and he's they only see me as that they don't see me who i'm now because you know they've got their own life they, they you know they don't have bandwidth for parents um yeah that's my biggest regret Absolutely. From a kid who fled uh, Sri Lanka due to ethnic cleansing, came to Australia, 
went through uh, the cycle of integration of society, did the corporate life, made money, traveled the world, lost money, lost money, <laughs> and then suddenly went uh, thinking now to go back to the, his original roots. Your story is one of its kind. It's a lesson that everyone should learn out of it. Sometimes we all agree that money is not going to give you happiness. Sometimes it's better if you stay in your homeland because one day you're going to regret it and one day you're going to go back. It doesn't matter what you do. You will always go back to your homeland but this, because this is your comfort zone. So hopefully the viewers who are listening to you now, you have, they will understand that, yes, they can live, survive, they can change places. It's um, They can fight. Nothing can block them. Nothing can stop them. But it is the country you're born in that will never leave your heart. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I love the experience. It was really good. I think uh, I, I feel the content might not be for everyone. And... Uh, but it's great. It's a. Uh, I think you and me, when we when we were talking, very very similar. I have a very disruptive mindset, and I see this as a, a, a mechanism of disruption, the way that we think. But it's is important because with disruption comes learnings. You know, we get to learn things, stuff things about ourselves we don't know about, and it's great. I think it's important to be able to do. The whole cookie cutter stuff is is just boring. Like it's what's what's the point of that? Whereas if you asking very tough questions, it's questions that we all ask ourselves. Hundred percent. Every human being on this planet asks ourselves those questions, but very few are willing to push the boundaries to find answers. Good. Would you recommend Brains Blood to other guests? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you.